an early age on, I was told as a young black boy, if you see white people walking down the sidewalk, especially if it's a man, you step off to the side and drop your head until he passed by, because if you didn't, he might consider that to be disrespectful. He might hit you, he might kick you, he might beat you. My grandfather, he would take me with him downtown Hattiesburg to, to pay bills. And I remember my grandfather wore a straw hat with this colorful blue band around the, the, the hat. And as a white person approached us on the sidewalk or crosswalk, he would tip his hat in what I would call an extra short deference. And by the time my grandfather and I reached back to his house, we had bowed so many times to, to white people. They taught young kids like myself how to play the role of that second-class citizen. There are a lot of phonies who will stand up and tell you that, oh, well, all are equal in the eyes of God. How silly can you get? Christ himself was the greatest teacher of segregation. Mississippi really stood like an island of resistance. That only 6.7% of blacks were registered to vote prior to spring summer compared to 56 or 70 percent in other southern states. Most of the rest of America didn't seem to care, and that's what Freedom Summer was about. If we bring white students and black students from all over the country, then everyone will pay attention to Mississippi. We'll bring America to Mississippi because America is not paying attention to Mississippi. In the 50s and 60s, particularly in the old plantation agricultural areas of the state, African Americans made up at least half, and in some cases, 70 or 80 percent of the population. And in some counties, of course, there was a realistic understanding that uh, if black people voted, they probably would be electing black officials. A lot of white people thought that African Americans in the South would literally take over, and white people would have to move. They would have to get out of the state. I was born in Mississippi, and I'm the product of the society in which I was raised. And I have a vested interest in that society, and I, along with a million other white Mississippians, will do everything in our power to protect that vested interest. There was no Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi during this early period, and there wasn't any need for one. The Citizens Council was doing everything that the Ku Klux Klan would have done, there were a lot of prominent people who were members, businessmen, bankers, lawyers, politicians. I joined it because I believed in what they were doing and I believed in trying to preserve the society in which we live. This is the Citizens Council Forum, the American viewpoint for the Southern accent. The Citizens Council was really running the state of Mississippi. It was part of the whole apparatus of, of a white supremacist society, that you had the local police, you had the registrar, you had everyone involved in uh, the Citizens Council. They succeeded in preventing almost all blacks who attempted to register from registering to vote. Political participation was something reserved for whites. And if blacks saw it, they could get hurt in lots of different ways, ranging from economic reprisals, loss of jobs, or if you had a business, uh, uh, restrictions or being placed on your business, or if you had a loan, your loan being called in. The common theory about Mississippi was that you could not attack Mississippi from the inside. It had to be attacked from the outside. You had to stand away and say, this is an awful place, and it ought to fix itself. But Bob Moses and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee said, no, that's not true. We can do it ourselves. Bob Moses was a high school teacher in New York City. 
He went south in 1960, originally just feeling he had to go, had to get involved. Snick sent him to Mississippi. He started going around on his own in rural areas where people simply didn't go and challenge the status quo. What made him stand out was not only his sheer courage, but his calm courage. I can't tell you that Bob Moses was afraid because he never showed it. <laughs> he just went about his work and there was this, this calm sense of mission. Bob went over there by himself in 1961. And by the end of 61, maybe there were five or six different people in the state. In 62, maybe there were 18, 19. And in 63, maybe there were 23, 24. We have a staff meeting that all fit in one little room. Young people working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as we call it, are characterized by a restless energy. They seek radical change in race relations in the United States. Their world is upset. And they feel that if they are ever going to get it straight, they must upset it more. I don't want anybody to think that we were a bunch of really brave Negroes running around Mississippi. That's not what we were. The reason that SNCC, as it were, opened up the Delta is we were young and foolish. We didn't have the, under the, the very complete understanding of what that risk was. But what impressed me was that there were black Mississippians who did know, who did know how dangerous it was. Well, we met this cadre of older people who had been fighting. They were eager for our help and, and glad we were there. They knew that the key to unlocking Mississippi revolved around the vote. Access for black people to power at that time has got to be through the vote. What was useful was that I was open and accustomed to listening. What we were trying to do was to organize these communities to take possession of their own lives. For the last hundred years, the ability of black people to control their own destiny had been taken away from them. When I got cooked up with Bob Moses, it was very simple. Go out through the community, knock on doors, talk to people. The only way to better your life we would tell them that if they uh, registered and voted, uh, they could elect the sheriff, and that the, uh, the uh, intimidation on the part of the sheriff's office uh, and his deputies, uh, they could change that. One of the things that I always tell them is that we could stop Mr. Charlie from lynching us. You're sitting on front porches or you're walking out into a cotton field or maybe you're at the juke joint having a beer. What we were doing was embedding ourselves uh, in these communities. You have your certificate showing that you are a registered voter. They haven't given it to me yet. Well, you are a registered voter. Huh? We want you to come down to the courthouse tomorrow. Immediately, what you found out you were dealing with was fear. So why not go tomorrow? We will furnish you transportation, so that's no excuse. They would say, you're right, boy. We should be registered to vote. But I ain't going down there and mess with them white people. You like to go to the No. We did not get 
a large number of people to try and register to vote. And then within that small group of people who did try and register to vote, very few of them actually got registered to vote. Other people are standing in the courthouse who can't see by me have to stand out here in the rain in order to register to vote. The denial of our constitutional rights. Your section of the Constitution that I choose to use number 48. The registrar had total control over who was accepted and who wasn't. The voting form was one of the most complicated you would ever, ever have. And as part of that, each person would have to interpret a section of the state constitution. We had people who taught in colleges. We had people with deep PhD, master degrees, and all, and uh, they couldn't pass. You had to be white. No, Jenny, you didn't try. If you see that, you didn't fill out but just look that. You just filled out that part, and look, you didn't write anything in there. You didn't try. Sometimes a sheriff would walk into the room while they were taking the voting test and say, Annie May. Don't you work for my mother-in-law? My mother-in-law would be horrified if she knew you were taking this test. Now, Annie Mae, I'll tell you. If you'll just put that paper down, I'll tear it up, and I won't tell my mother-in-law. In some counties, when people went in to register, why their names would appear in the newspaper the next day. That could have recriminations for all members of their family. It could mean they would lose their job. There were real consequences to, to taking this risk. It wasn't simply that you would go down and get turned away.